And I'm happy to welcome you to this Beyond the Headlines event featuring Misha Glenning, author of Dark Market, Cyber Thieves, Cyber Cops, and You. Uh, now, I imagine all of you have had the experience that's happened to me often. Um, you've departed the house headed for work, and you suddenly realize that you've left your cell phone at home. Uh, after cursing yourself, you ponder for a moment uh, whether you can actually make it through the rest of the day uh, without the cell phone. That moment, you find, is a brief one uh, and ends with you turning around and going back home again uh, because, in fact, none of us can function today without that basic communication device in our pocket. We are residents of an interconnected world of networked systems. We are, in a word, dependent. Of course, for all the advantages that this interconnectedness brings us, it also leaves us highly vulnerable and open to exploitation. And that's where the international cast of cunning and innovative manipulators that Misha Glennie writes about comes in. It's a world of characters with comic book names, but deadly serious intent. There are Matrix and Iceman, Lord Sirik, fiendish Devilman, Master Splinter, Kumbajani, and Red Brigade, and criminal agglomerates like Shadow Crew and All Seeing Phantom. These crime minded geeks and nerds make colossal amounts of illicit money and spend it ostentatiously, but they are hardly glamorous jewelry heist movie types. Your average cyber criminal has the manners of a chimpanzee and the tongue of a Sicilian fishwife, writes Misha. <laughs> In this dark universe of cyber crime, cyber warfare, and cyber industrial espionage, the most common illicit activity on the interwebs, aside from pornography, is some form of fraud tied to the theft and cloning of personal credit cards. And Misha makes that the focus of much of his book. Dark Market was the name of a vast criminal website with a membership of 2,000 of these credit card fraudsters and its own escrow system to guarantee payment. And Misha goes inside it to write about its creation, its function, and its eventual shutdown. He takes his readers to the first ever cybercrime convention, the Worldwide Carters Conference in Odessa in June 2001, and talks about the ease with which these professional carters can game the system and make enormous sums of money. A group of Swedes, in one example of excess that Misha recounts, go to Monte Carlo with a dozen cloned American Express Centurion cards and withdraw $400,000 in a single weekend. Nobody challenged us once, said one of them. And you got the feeling that people did this sort of thing all the time. Misha, a former BBC journalist in Central and Eastern Europe, has chronicled this activity and the counter moves by a host of law enforcement agencies from a number of countries in a book that is frankly a great detective story or as Charlie Rose put it in a recent conversation on his show with Misha, a real thriller. Misha has the bestseller author's trick of trailing a tantalizing, forward-looking question at the end of each chapter so you feel compelled to keep plunging ahead nonstop, and I fell for it every time. <laughs> it's a compelling read about a fascinating up-to-the-minute subject of real consequence I mention that because there are books for sale at the door, and Misha will be here at the end of the discussion to sign them for you. So Misha, now is the time to tell us about this swampy world of carters and rippers and spammers and skimmers and crackers and key loggers and virus makers that you've been hanging out in for the last two or three years and why clean livers like us need to worry about it. Welcome to IPI, Misha. The floor is yours. Uh, <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Warren, for that introduction, and thank you for uh, inviting me here in 
uh, the first place. It's, it's uh, great to be here. And I love talking about this story because it is extremely bizarre and odd and gripping in its own way. But I, I got into it um, about five or six years ago when I was researching my previous book, McMafia, uh, which is about more conventional transnational organized crime. And uh, the thing that I did with McMafia, which I felt I had to do in order to make it sort of credible and interesting and of, of value, was to go and speak to people who are involved in the business of transnational organized crime. So I went to different countries around the world uh, talking to uh, uh, criminals <coughs> largely in a non-judgmental way. I wasn't interested in nailing them as mass murderers or anything like that. I wanted to know how they got into the business in the first place, what attracted them to the sector, why it was uh, <clears throat> so compelling, and uh, how they survived and prosper in as organized criminals. And uh, when I went to Brazil, I, uh, one of the things I liked to do was to pick crimes which were sort of counterintuitive in terms of, in terms of the uh, location. And when I went to Brazil, I, I discovered almost immediately that Brazil was one of the great incubators of cybercrime around the world, along with other BRIC countries, chiefly Brazil, Russia, and China. Um, <coughs> uh, India was there as, as well, but to a lesser extent. Um, and uh, through good fortune and through some research, I met a group of criminal hackers. And uh, this was half of a gang. The other half had been, had been busted and uh, prosecuted, who were involved in something that the cyber police in, in Brasilia uh, referred to as Operation Pegasus. And Operation Pegasus was a sort of 101 cybercrime, uh, act of uh, cybercrime, which involved sending out millions upon millions of... Uh, spam email around the world, um, which persuaded people to click on particular links which infected their computers. And so the guys who had spent out the spam, sent out the spam email could then read these people's passwords when they inputted them uh, when they were going on to their, to their bank accounts. Now, um, one of the things about cybercrime, one of the sort of misconceptions of cybercrime, is, is that you have to be uh, incredibly technically gifted to become involved in cybercrime. But this is actually not true. Uh, I would estimate that around 80% of cybercriminal activity does not involve hacking. It involves what is known in the trade as social engineering. And social engineering is the art of persuading people to do with their computers which is something which is objectively not in their interests. Now, at a very early stage of, uh, of uh, the internet, cyber criminals worked out that the fastest way to uh, persuade people to do things uh, uh, with their computers which were not in their interests was to offer the promise of sex, virtual or, or otherwise, which is, it's no coincidence, I don't know if you remember, the, uh, one of the fastest spreading viruses of uh, the late 1990s, early 2000s, was called I Love You, the I Love You virus. So you would get a spam email in your box, and it said, the strap line was, I love you, dot, dot, dot. Now, we're all human, <laughs> even if we're happily married, we see something like that and we say, oh my God, who is it, who loves me? And people couldn't resist. Now, I was very fortunate when the I love you virus came around because the first person, this is perfectly true, the first person I received it from uh, was my ex-wife. <laughs> and uh, she uh, harbored all sorts of emotions towards me but at that time, love was definitely not amongst them. <laughs> so as soon as I saw this, this email from my ex-wife saying, I love you, I said, wait a minute. 
there's something fishy going on here, which is exactly what it was, a fishing attack. And um, so I was able to throw it into the uh, trash and spare myself a very nasty in infection. And um, this, is, uh, this is primarily how cybercrime works on the lowest level. And it worked for this group called o who, who ran Operation Pegasus. Now, four of them were arrested, four of them got away. And uh, I managed to meet uh, two of the characters who were involved in Operation Pegasus. These people, over a roughly a two-year period, netted over $200 million. This is a huge sum of money, but comparable to the best uh, cybercrime uh, operations, particularly um, in the late 90s and in the first eight, nine years of, uh, of the first decade of uh, this century, um, when um, uh, the response to cybercrime was still relatively poor and, uh, and, and relatively weak in terms of banks and law enforcement and so on and so forth. Uh, anyway, so I met one of the uh, chief characters and he explained to me how the whole thing worked. Um, he had been responsible for writing the program which sent out the spam email. Um, he was 19 years old. And this is really very striking, is, is that when it comes to very serious cyber criminal attacks, a lot of the time you will find that the people involved are still in their teens. Not only that, and I'll go into this a little bit later, um, it's almost impossible to imagine these people being involved in any form of conventional crime. I.e., the internet has created um, a certain body of people who are engaged in criminal activity who are only criminals because of the existence of the internet, which is something that I'm, I'll, I'll touch on a little bit a little bit later. Anyway, so he was very young. I then interviewed the cyber police in Brasilia who had busted the other four members of the group. And I also had the opportunity at the time to interview, there's a company in, based out of Atlanta, Georgia, called uh, ISS, which has since been bought by IBM, which is one of the biggest uh, sort of corporate protection companies uh, in the world. And um, they had uh, a filial in an office in Sao Paulo because of the fact that Brazil was such an important area for cyber attacks. <laughs> so they have a big office in Sao Paulo and I went there. And while I was there, there was a character down from Atlanta who named Peter Aller, who was uh, the head of their special investigations unit, which had the appropriately dramatic title of X-Force. And uh, Peter Aller was a former head of the CIA's cyber division. And this is something that in subsequent, uh, subsequent research I've come across all over the place. When you go into you know, places like McAfee or Symantec uh, or even Microsoft and Google, you know, with all their sort of touchy-feely West Coast uh, sort of atmosphere, you go to the security department and you're invariably talking to people who are ex-Secret Service, ex-CIA, ex-FBI, ex-DEA, and so on and so forth, ex-DIA as well. And uh, the interesting thing is, is, is that the United States government invests a huge amount of money in uh, training up people involved in cyber security for state agencies. And then as soon as they show promise and ability, along come the uh, the new giants, the giants of the new uh, of the new economy from the West Coast, like Google and Yahoo and so on, and they offer these guys ten times as much money, uh, as well as a new home in California. And obviously, it's a no-brainer. Everyone leaves Washington and goes and works for the private sector, which is a problem for the U.S. government in in the long term. That they are developing highly specialized workers who, as soon as they become effective, get poached by the private private sector. But uh, we can maybe talk about that later during questions. Anyway, Peter Aller explained to me what was going on in cyberspace. 
that, unbeknownst to us ordinary users, there was this tremendous arms race going on between criminals and the private sector and uh, governments, which the private sector was basically losing, that the number of ta attacks happening every year was getting greater and, and greater, and the ingenuity of uh, criminals um, was, uh, was increasing as time went on. And I thought to myself there, when I finished writing McMaffey, I hadn't even finished writing McMaffey at the time, but I thought when I finished writing McMaffey, I must write something on cybercrime. <coughs> And one of the things when you start researching, there are, there are two, uh, as a writer, there are two really important things about cyber when you start writing about it. The first thing is, is that for the great majority of population, the subject is witlessly boring. So this is really difficult as a writer. Computers send people to sleep within minutes when you start talking about it. So, as a writer, you think, well, how am I going to get around that? How am I going to make people interesting? So, <clears throat> what I did was I went back and I watched um, all Hollywood movies from War Games onwards, which purport to have computers at their very heart. And uh, I watched them to see how much of it was about computers. And the answer is about 1 or 2% of the film is about computers, and the rest of it is a standard Hollywood narrative. And every so often, every sort of 40 minutes or so, somebody sits down by a keyboard and starts tipping madly and says, oh my god, it's over there! And everyone runs over there, and that's it. And then that's the end of the computer for the next 40 minutes. Uh, and I also, at the same time, read the Millennium Trilogy, the Stieg Larsson's great uh, um, uh, um, th uh, trilogy about uh, Sweden um, and uh, big business and politics and organized crime. And when I spoke to people about the Millennium Trilogy, people who had read it, they all said, my God, isn't it amazing what that woman, Elizabeth Salander, can do with those computers? And uh, I said, yes, it is absolutely amazing. But the interesting thing is, is if you read it, Again, it takes up about 1 or 2% of the narrative, the computers. That is, is that computers are highly interesting and effective, provided they're only administered in very tiny doses. You talk about computers for more than 1 or 2% of a book, and uh, you've lost your audience. So I, as a writer, say, well, how am I going to write about cybercrime <clears throat> without talking about computers? And so I say, right, well, uh, forget the computers. Uh, I'm not a techie. I probably know more about computer security than most people in this room. Um, but I, I'm not a, a, a technology specialist. And I thought, right, let's go and find the people who engage in cybercrime. Who are these hackers? Where do they come from? Now, the one thing about Elizabeth Salander, which doesn't ring true, although she is a wonderfully drawn character, and I think the first great literary heroine of the 21st century. The one thing which doesn't ring true is her gender. She's female. I've done the research on this, and 95% of hackers are male. And this is very important, not just that 95% of hackers are male, but have a look when you research but you probably don't know who runs the internet. What is the internet? Who actually, you know, who who turns it on and turns it off? What are where are, do we know? Well, yes, there are little organisations, some of them private, some of them state sector, which actually control the internet. And if you do a study of the number of the people who work there, you will find that about ninety percent of them are men. This is a technology which is so heavily male oriented um, that. Uh, Elizabeth's skills are hard to grasp, although I think Larshan draws the character so well that it is utterly credible. And there are some female hackers out there. Now, the point about Salanda, which is really important, is, is she displays a lot of characteristics which in a clinical situation you could identify as being consistent with a diagnosis of either Asperger's syndrome or autism. And my hackers, who I tracked all over the world, I went down, I found them in prisons, uh, I found them on the run, I found them enjoying their ill-gotten gains. I would say about 60% of them 
had character, behavioral characteristics and intelligence levels and abilities which were consistent with those of Elizabeth Salander. And this goes back to the original point about hackers being young. They learn their skills aged between about 13 and 16. They have real difficulty sometimes in engaging with the outside world in terms of social communications. But on the internet, they are sovereign operators who garner tremendous reputational, um, uh, tremendous reputations uh, amongst their peers. But of course, they're getting involved in this hacking work, and it's very difficult to know when is hacking illegal and when is hacking not illegal? When is breaking into a server or just examining whether a server has an opening, a vulnerability, legal, and when is it not illegal? We don't know. Well, we do know in the United States, because in the United States, under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, anything which is defined as exceeding authorized access is a criminal act. Now, about two months or so ago, um, when was it? No, it was in August of last year, so a bit longer. Um, my daughter, 19-year-old daughter, who's slightly feckless, went missing one night. <laughs> and uh, she was meant to be going to stay the night at her mother's, the same one who, who I got that virus from, as it happened. <laughs> and um, she left my place at 6 o'clock in the evening, and her mother was going to take her to the airport to fly off the next morning. And at 1 o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call from her mother saying, where's Sasha? And I said, well, she left here seven hours ago. She's with you. And she said, no, she hasn't turned up. And her phone's turned off. And I can't get in touch with her. And uh, so we furiously, you know, rang one or two people who we knew she was. No one knew where she was. And so I decided to hack into her Facebook account. <laughs> This is a big deal, hacking into a child's Facebook account. But hack, it, hack I did. How did I hack into a Facebook account? Is it because I'm a great computer technical specialist? No, we know that I'm not. I did it because about seven years ago, my daughter told me what her password to her Hotmail account was. And sure enough, seven years later, she's still using the same password for everything, including her banking. This is one of why the lives of cyber criminals are made so easy, is because none of us can be bothered to change our passwords. You know who you are. And um, so in I went straight away, got into her Facebook, and I wrote a thing saying, this is not Sasha. This is her father. Sasha's gone missing. Please, can you let us know what is uh, happening if you happen to know? And within about 50 minutes, someone had rung her, and she had then rung her mother and said, and she was with some boy, and she said, I'm okay, don't worry, I'll see you. I'll see you later sort of thing. Now, she didn't speak to me for the next couple of weeks, <laughs> partly because she was so embarrassed because her behavior was so bad and partly because she was furious with me for hacking into her Facebook account. I don't know if any of you have got children who use Facebook, but you know, you walk into the room and wham, down goes the Facebook browser. You know, you're not allowed to see. This is my privilege. Have you noticed how children have learned the language of the human rights community? It is quite <laughs> astonishing. Uh, you know, privacy, child abuse, oh, shut up. And um, but with me, anyhow. Um, anyway, so she was very angry. And um, now, if she had been living along with me in the United States, and along with being feckless, she had been vindictive, she could have taken me to court under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and uh, charged me with exceeding authorized access and I would risk, in that instance, uh, a criminal, uh, a, um, a, a period of imprisonment. Because what we, have, what we have started to do in the Western world is we have started to impose draconian, um, draconian uh, um, punishments on people, uh, on people who hack. Now, the point is we don't differentiate between whether they are an officer of the People's Liberation Army, one of the guys from Dark Market who's out to steal your wallet, somebody from Anonymous who wants to make a political point, um, but who doesn't want to use uh, um, Stratfor's 
Stratfor's passwords and uh, emails for, and credit cards for their own personal gain, or somebody like Gary McKinnon in the United Kingdom, who is subject to extradi extradition proceedings here in the United States, but is being blocked in the United Kingdom, um, who it was basically wanted to see whether the Pentagon had uh, come across evidence of, of uh, little green men arriving in the, in, on the world in the 1950s and 1960s, and who is certified as Asperger's with a secondary condition of uh, clinical depression. There is no differentiation. There is no way of rehabilitating hackers who have been imprisoned uh, for hacking. I have the case that I describe here in Dark Market of one Max Vision, a uh, terrific guy. And uh, Max, um, in the late 1990s, was one of the West Coast's best so-called penetration testers. Um, and uh, penetration testers are paid by big, big companies to hack into their systems to find out the vulnerabilities. Now, that is a legal hack. But of course, in order to learn the hacking skills in the first place, you have to have done it illegally. And so there's a real problem here in terms of what people can and can't do in terms of developing their hacking skills on the internet. Anyway, uh, Max was very good. He got paid a lot of money, but he was a congenital almost hacker. And he spent his entire time looking for vulnerabilities around the internet in the world. And he came across a vulnerability which affected all US government systems, including those governing systems at nuclear research labs at places like uh, Livermore. And because he was a decent guy and a patriot, he patched up that vulnerability so that nobody, the People's Liberation Army, the KGB, nobody could get in there uh, anymore. Good for Max. But of course, because he was an inveterate hacker, he put it in a tiny little wormhole through which only he could wriggle because he couldn't resist it because that's what hackers are like. And this was spotted by an eagle eye investigator from the uh, Air Force who had responsibility for uh, cybersecurity at the time. And as a consequence, he was put, he received a sentence of two years and he was put in the Taft Correctional Institute in California. Now, the Taft Correctional Institute is an open prison. Who goes into open prisons? Fraudsters and white collar criminals. And when Max Vision, master hacker, but a depressed, Aspergery type of guy gets placed in the laps of these fraudsters. They can't believe it. A goose that lays golden eggs has been delivered up to them by the criminal justice system. And when Max is released and he can't get a job because he's got a criminal record, he can't work in security, he can't get his teeth fixed because this is America and you can't get your teeth fixed if you don't have any money in America. Uh, sorry, that's a, it's just an entirely separate issue. Um, uh, he's miserable and out come some people from the Taft Correctional Institute and say, Max, here's an apartment in San Francisco, here's a car, here are some girls if you want girls, here is an alien, this is top of range, alienware computer just for you and all you have to do is do a little bit of work on our behalf. And he became one of the master hackers. He actually engaged in a battle with Dark Market, which is why uh, I relate his uh, story. But he was fantastically successful and very, very difficult to track uh, down. Now, he was eventually busted, and this man with a planetary-sized brain is sitting in Lompoc, California, where he'll be for the next 12 years or so. And uh, I think that you, you, in the United States, one's got to start rethinking how you deal and how you uh, approach with hackers, which is some of the work that I'm doing now. Now, I'm going to finish up by saying that first problem that I had was how do you write about a subject which is witlessly boring? So I, I wrote about these guys who come from all different parts of the world, from Sri Lanka, from Ukraine, from Turkey, they come from all sorts of different social backgrounds, but I'd said that most of them share these characteristics, including an advanced ability in maths and or sciences, usually, usually physics. Um, but the second issue that you come across when you start researching into cybercrime is you cannot understand cybercrime without looking into the world of cyber industrial espionage and cyber warfare as well, because the great genius of the internet is its interconnectedness. But in terms of security, that interconnectedness is its Achilles heel as well. And so you have two groups of people who, if you look at those three pillars, cybercrime, industrial espionage, 
and uh, warfare. And generally, we have three types of people policing those uh, pillars, those three pillars. We have law enforcement, we have the private sector doing uh, corporate work, and then we have the military doing the cyber warfare stuff. But there are two agencies which move backwards and forwards between those three pillars. One are the hackers themselves, because you need at one point advanced hacking ability, whether you're a criminal, whether you're an industrial spy, or whether you're involved in cyber warfare. And the other agency is intelligence agencies. So here I am working on cybercrime, a big cyber criminal operation, and I suddenly start bumping into people from Turkish domestic intelligence, from MI6. They're all looking around and seeing where are the hackers going? Who is involved in cybercrime? What are they using that money for? Are the skills from somebody, say, in Carter Planet, the original um, cyber forum, the people who created the first worldwide Carter's conference, which was held in May and June 2002 in Odessa, a marvelous event, which I describe in, in the book. Are they working with the Russian state? When the Russian state, uh, it is thought, orders the massive cyber attack on Estonia in April and May 2007, who is actually perpetrating that attack? Why are some of those attacks coming from the criminal internet service providers usually associated with the distribution of child pornography or credit card operations? So we have become hugely dependent on networked computer systems. We don't like to know about the technology because it's simply too confusing and too boring. And yet, unfortunately, because our dependency is such, and let's not forget what happened last October mm -hmm. when BlackBerry servers went down first in the United Kingdom, then in the United States. I happened to be at a think tank in Washington on the day that it happened. You know, people who are sort of hyper BlackBerry addicted, and they were going around the office banging their heads against the brick wall because they couldn't check their emails every five minutes. Now, that's just BlackBerry going down for four or five hours. What happens when everything that we rely on has happened to a small degree in Estonia in 2007, what happens when they stop working, when the traffic lights go out, when you can't get cash out of ATM machines? Computers have enabled us to work logistics so tightly in the commercial sector that one thing goes wrong and basically goods don't appear in the shops. But also, we, individual users, are the greatest vulnerability in the computer network system. Before, if something like, if your car broke down, okay, it was a pain for you, you were likely to stand by the side of the road for six hours, but life would go on. Nowadays, if that were to happen in a complex system, it wouldn't just be you who would be inconvenienced, it could be thousands of people. So, <clears throat> with these threats proliferating, and I haven't even started to talk about what the importance, perhaps we can do that in questions, of Stuxnet is, the Stuxnet virus, which attacked two uh, Iranian enrichment facilities in Iran uh, in 2010, 2011. I haven't talked about that yet, but we are seeing a proliferation of very, very dangerous viruses, which are sometimes being created by non-state actors, sometimes being created by states and other types of uh, cyber weapons. Um, your drones here in the United States have been affected by a virus that the Pentagon cannot clean out of those drones. It doesn't appear to be doing anything, but it's very, very depressing, the, fact that the idea that drones have been infected by a computer virus. So all this is happening outside of any international framework or control because nobody is prepared to concede their relative uh, advantage, and they're all very different, the advantages they have, state to state, uh, in terms of uh, coming up with some sort of framework treaty about what we do about this. So whilst I know that at the moment we're all really concerned about economic collapse in Europe and elsewhere in the world, and believe you me, coming from Europe, we are terrified about what is going on in the economic world. 
This is a problem which people can no longer, uh, the problem of cybersecurity, shove under the carpet. It is no longer something that can be the domain solely of computer uh, technology and security specialists and securocrats. We all have to start learning about this problem, um, even if it appears daunting and boring or whatever. And uh, I hope the dark market will be a very modest beginning contribution uh, for everyone to start working out how important this is. Thanks very much. Mm. Misha, terrific. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and then open it up to the floor here because I'm sure there are a lot of questions out there. Um, I want to go back to the, to the, um, to the idea of, of fraudsters getting into your personal credit cards or into your bank account. There are some people who say basically that's a victimless crime because the bank will make you whole, the credit card company will give you money back. I know you believe it is not a victimless crime, but how does it become a victim crime? Uh, well, it works, like, it works like this. First of all, banks were very slow, particularly here in the United States, to deal with the issue of credit and debit card fraud and a bank account, uh, bank account hacking. Um, uh, but what happens now, you may have experienced this, if your credit card is compromised as the... Uh, as, as, as is the word that's used to describe it, i.e. if someone's got hold of it and is using it, they would, I mean, ironically, when I was writing uh, Dark Market, this happened to me. I was in the middle of uh, uh, doing some writing. The phone went. It was somebody from my bank, National Westminster, saying, hello, Mr. Glennie, have you uh, recently purchased $500 worth of jewelry in Sofia, Bulgaria? <laughs> and I said, I said, no, I didn't explain to him that actually I travel to Sofia quite regularly, but that's by the way. I said, no, I haven't. But um, he said, oh, well, don't worry, don't worry. Uh, it's a fraudulent, uh, it's a fraudulent transaction, but you needn't worry about it. We've dealt with it already. You're not going to be charged anything. Thank you very much. And he puts the phone down. And you think, oh, thank God for that. My credit card's been compromised, and it's costing me nothing. So good old <laughs> bank is what you think first of all. And then you stop and say, hold it. Who's paying that $500? The bank paying the $500? Well, no, we know the banks don't pay for anything. And so uh, they're certainly not going to cough up. So what they do is they go to their insurance or broker, and interestingly, it is only in the banking sector that we have a developed cyber fraud mar uh, insurance, secondary insurance market. In terms of corporations and commerce who are having to deal with the tax all the time, there is no developed insurance market. People cannot insure themselves against data breaches. They can in the banking industry because the banking industry is so closed that it knows how much money it is losing, and it shares that with one instance and one instance alone, and that's the insurance market. The insurance company then pays out, because they're paying out, they do, of course, raise the premiums, and then the banks simply raise their charges on all of their customers. So we are all paying for credit card fraud. In some instances, you can see this in the insurance industry now, this is not cyber related, but in terms of uh, vehicle fraud, for example, although this is often cyber assisted vehicle fraud in the United Kingdom, where we have a huge amount of car theft in London. Uh, we have outrageous insurance premiums now, almost exclusively as a consequence of, uh, of um, the high levels of theft and the high levels of fraudulent claims on insurance companies. So you do end up paying for it, and it can be eventually quite, quite painful. Now, the banks have got somewhat better in terms of protecting themselves, but here in the United States, there is this glaring anomaly, which is that you have ref your banks have refused to introduce chip and pin, which everyone knows is a slam dunk way of bringing down the level. It doesn't eliminate it, but it brings down hugely the level, level of credit card fraud. But the banks won't do it because they think it will cost them too much. Um, let me ask you something that you suggested we could talk about in the question. Uh, situation, then we'll move to the audience, and that, of course, is Stuxnet. You don't really talk about cyber warfare in the book, but you certainly have now in your remarks. Um, where were you going to go with that Stuxnet 
uh, reference? But well, everything changes with, uh, with Stuxnet, because until Stuxnet happens, the idea of a major uh, attack on what is referred to as the critical national infrastructure is a theoretical idea. There is not a major attack that we knew of against critical national uh, infrastructure. And of course, this is what the sort of doomsayers of the cybersecurity world, of whom the most articulate is, is Dick Clark, um, with his book, Cyber Warfare, this, they, they refer to as Cybergeddon or, or Digital Pearl Harbor, um, whereby basically the stuff of life stops functioning. Now, Stuxnet um, took about six months to develop. It's estimated with about 10 to 12 highly um, specialized cybersecurity people to do it, i.e. the sort of resources that is required uh, that, that only states can, states can provide. And Stuxnet was peculiar because it had four zero-day vulnerabilities in it. Uh, which I won't go into the details of zero-day vulnerabilities, um, but they are the sort of magic key if you're creating viruses, and zero-day vulnerabilities are hard to find, but it's what a lot of uh, uh, virus writers spend their time doing, is working out zero-day vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities which companies haven't yet spotted. So this was a very sophisticated operation, and its aim was quite clear once it had been uh, um, uh, once it had been reverse engineered. Its aim was to go specifically to the motor which ran the pump that spread water around the uranium enrichment facility and it only worked with a very, very specific type of Siemens plant. And not only that, it was written so that nothing would recognize that it was there. Nothing in the Siemens plant would recognize that it, was, uh, that it was there. It was extremely sophisticated. Not only that, both of these plants were offline. They were not connected to the internet, which meant that you had a combination of new-style espionage, the virus itself, and old-style espionage. Somebody had to go over the perimeter fence at night, or you had to you have a spy inside the company who used, a, mm -hmm. who used a, a, a memory stick to put it in there. Now, what's really important about Stuxnet is not whether it was the US or Israel that did it or a combination of the two, or as one minority uh, theory has it, the Chinese. What's important is, is that somebody has put all the resources into developing Stuxnet and then says to the world, not only have we developed this, but we can deploy it. And that virus risked um, a, a serious accident at a nuclear plant. Now, leaving aside that it's Iran and what you think about Iran, the point is, is once that had happened, it was gloves off. And everyone around the world said, whoa, people are deploying. That means we have got to start getting our act together. And since Stuxnet, without, as I say, any form of international treaty, people are sitting down and developing these weapons hands, hand over hand over fist now. And there is an arms race going on which is not being controlled and uh, we need to push this up the, uh, uh, up the agenda because these viruses can do immense damage to our lives. Excellent. If you would raise your hand, I'll call on you. And once again, when you get the microphone, please hold it steady because uh, we're being webcast. <coughs> Uh, and also, could I ask you to stand up? It, uh... Thank you. I'm David Tereshuk from the Media Beat. Thanks, Misha. Uh, two, two questions. One very quick one, just out of personal curiosity. You, <clears throat> you mentioned the Asperger's uh, facet that uh, so many of these young people, you also said they were young, tended to um, share. An interest in music as well? Not that, uh, not that I know, uh, but an interest in games. They're, most of them are fanatical gamers. And in fact, one of them, uh, Matrix, uh, who's uh, a German, it's important to note that they come from very different social backgrounds. Matrix comes from a, a very respectable middle-class family in, in South Germany. His mother actually worked as a clerk of the local court. And he got into it because he was obsessed about games, but he couldn't afford to buy them. And so he hacked them. 
And once he'd pirated the games, he then needed to, st to store them. And he stored them by teaching himself to hack into the servers of major corporations all over the world and plonk his games there. And he controlled those servers. And one of the things that he said to me when I interviewed him, he said, you wouldn't believe the number of companies who uh, either don't have a password at all or have as their main password admin, or as he said, the most stupid of all passwords, password. <laughs> uh, and he said, all of this is like, he says, it's like people going with their wallet into a shopping mall and putting it in the middle of the shopping mall, opening it up and saying, take it, it's there. And so there is a, there is a real need for people to take their security more sensibly. And that's not just individuals, it is companies and corporations who are allowing this to happen. So games was much more important than music. They do talk about music, but I would say that it's secondary rather than primary. Interesting. Uh, I'm zooming right up to the macro. Uh, I was at a session in a room not unlike this with two different individuals uh, playing your roles. One was Henry Kissinger, the other was John Huntsman, uh, very nearly the uh, winner in New Hampshire, maybe. Uh, but the, the, what they were talking about was uh, just exactly what you were talking about just now, the real crying need for some kind of treaty uh, to uh, work, to function against international cyber attacks at that macro level. Uh, what possible hope could there be for it, though? Because I, mean, I can see the, the interest in nation states uh, wanting it, but how, how can you actually negotiate? Well, it's very difficult because the um, relative advantages that each state hold are so different, and they want to maintain those ad advantages. So let us look at, in terms of the sort of macro game, basically it's, uh, it's recognized that the United States remains the number one uh, developer of cyber offensive weaponry and also has the most sophisticated defenses in terms of the private, in terms of the private sector in particular, but to an extent the public sector as well. But uh, it's also known that Russia and China are not far behind. Israel punches way above its weight um, in terms of uh, uh, both defenses and cyber offensive capability. France and Britain, Germany, France and Britain in particular, come soon after that. And then, you, of course, you have a load of non-state actors as well as, as well as rogue state actors and so on and so forth. But the three big ones um, are China, Russia, and the United States, and also to uh, an important extent, Western Europe, European Union as, as, as well. Now, the United States rails very frequently at the highest level up to Secretary of State and indeed the President himself about the um, uh, uh, intolerable activity of the Chinese and the Russians, the Chinese in particular, when it comes to, it's not just industrial espionage, I mean the Chinese hoover up anything they possibly can, how they ever have the time to sit down and work out what the value of this data is, I don't know, um, but uh, it's no secret that they have an extensive cyber espionage uh, operation. Um, the Chinese also attempt to define what you can and can't do uh, in the internet in China, not quite as dramatically and draconianly, and draconianly as the Russians do with their Orwellian system SORM2, whereby all internet service providers in Russia have to send a mirror image of every bit that crosses the internet in Russia to FSB servers in Moscow. So the FSB knows everything that goes on which is why they're able to create this system of allowing criminals to do whatever they want in terms of credit cards in the European Union and the United States, provided they don't attack financial institutions in, in Russia. And when I uh, spoke to the guys from Carter Planet, uh, the Odessa-based group which started up the whole forum system, they were explicit about this, that they had an agreement with the FSB and the SBU in Ukraine that they would not touch Russian institutions and they were free to do what they wanted elsewhere. But the Russians know what's going on in their own internet. So you're seeing this fragmentation, and this is also happening in the US, it's also happening in the United Kingdom, the European Union as well, the fragmentation of the internet into huge national intranets, whereby there is a jurisdiction surrounding what can come in and out of the internet. Um, 
and they're very, very, they look very, very differently. So we bitch endlessly about the Chinese and their spying, as well we might, because they do spy endlessly. But have a look at this. Let's say that you're an officer of the FSB, a cyber officer of the FSB or of the, of the PLA, and you look at the United States. The United States controls a lot of the internet infrastructure. It holds the two largest databases of personal information in the world by far, to wit Facebook and Google, and in particular Gmail. Now, if you're an FBI officer or a CIA officer and you want to access something from a Gmail account with a court order, you can go into any Gmail or Facebook account you want within 24 hours. If you're an officer of the Serious Organized Crime Agency in Britain, which has very close relations with law enforcement here in the United States, you can put in a request, and if you're lucky, within four to six months, you will get to look at that Gmail account, by which time, believe you me, the birds have flown. If you're an FSB officer or a PLA officer, you can whistle. You have no chance of getting into that Gmail account, and so what do they do? They hack it. Because what they see is, is that the United States, with those databases combined with the extraordinary power of the NSA, together with the GCHQ, with the Canadians, with the uh, New Zealanders and the Australians, the US has phenomenal digital reach in, in terms of uh, espionage. And as far as the Chinese are concerned, we're operating on an unlevel playing field. So what all the discussions about the possibility of some sort of treaty are doing are trying to iron out these extraordinary difficulties of, of imbalance, basically. Now, in the past year or so, I've just begun to detect a change of language coming from China and Russia that they are beginning to get, they are becoming concerned. China has a lot of domestic cyber criminality. Uh, which is which is beginning to find a bit hard to deal with. That there's a slight change of tone coming both from Moscow, Beijing, and Washington, because there's a recognition that things are getting out of hand. That they have to start sitting down and working out some framework for dealing with all of this. This is at a very early stage. It's not yet at an institutionalized stage. But I think that is likely to be the way that things will go. Now, of course, you can get agreement between those three powers and the European Union. It doesn't account for what's going on in South Africa or Iran or Venezuela, where you have similarly you know, advanced hacking and espionage capability now. It's, it's a big leveler, cyber, in that sense. You don't need many resources to engage in the game of espionage. I hope we're all not so scared now. There are no more questions. Good, in the back. <laughs> Thank you. My name is uh, Alan Sacklow. And <clears throat> I wanted to ask you... Yeah. Yeah? Uh, just hold it up a little higher. Ah. You can hear me, yeah? <laughs> My name is Alan Sackler, and I wanted to ask you a very general question from a neophyte. Does the sheer weight and volume of all this uh, cyberspace, uh, not, is it in the end effect not a, an impediment to analytical skills and to, to draw the right conclusions from the sheer mass of, info, of, of raw data and raw materials available. Thank you. Yeah, well, it's, um, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. What, of course, people have been developing at the high end is computerized analytical tools. So that what they're looking for is data patterns. This is beyond human capacity. Uh, data patterns which are anomalous at an extremely micro level. So uh, that is, uh, that's how they're beginning to do it in terms of attacks on institutions and attacks on, on companies to overcome precisely this problem. Because if you uh, had to examine uh, manually everything that looked like a cyber attack, you know, you would never be, uh, uh, you would never, you, you would never um, sort of get out of, uh, get out of the starting uh, blocks. I mean, to, to give you an example, uh, in Western Canada, Bell Western Canada, 
processes every month 25 billion emails, of which 24 billion are spam. So now a lot of those spam are completely harmless, unless of course you're the sucker who decides to send $5,000 to some guy in Nigeria. Um, but uh, what they're doing, they're having to analyze those 24 billion. And they do it through this data crunching, whereby they can spot the anomalies which have links to infected, to infected websites. I, what are the dangerous spam as opposed to the relatively, relatively harmless spam? And that is done on a macro, on a macro level by the security companies um, at, at, at the high end. So there is some robotic uh, response to this. Um, but on the whole, I, I do also wonder how intelligence is able to deal with all this material. And it's one of the things that I wonder about the Chinese. I'm sure, you know, because all this stuff gets back to servers uh, in, in Hainan, Hainan uh, Island or wherever it is, wherever it is. And I don't know how they go about analyzing it, to be perfectly honest. I mean, it's not my bag, but people must know this. I mean, you know, people know it in Washington, I'm sure. I just haven't got an answer to it myself yet. Please, here in the second row. And could I ask you to stand and identify okay, yourself, please? Thank, okay, you. thank you. My name is Shongi Klaas from the South African Mission. Um, thank you so much for sharing with us this really interesting but yet scary thing. Uh, my question is regarding the developing countries like South Africa and others. I'm really worried listening to you now about these things. We do hear about people taking money from the state departments and then through the cyber crimes and so on. But the biggest concern I have is that these things, they do have the capability to actually lead to the complete shutdown of the whole government, especially with us, uh, with small economies. So my question therefore to you that what do you think such developing countries can do in order to prevent such calamities from happening. <laughs> Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I think the, f the first thing, I mean, you have a very, uh, there are big imbalances here in security capacity. Russia has a much, much bigger security capacity uh, than uh, Brazil or South Africa, for example. Uh, South Africa is very vulnerable. Um, <clears throat> its banking system perhaps less so. Its banking system has improved in the past three or four years, but things like ESCOM, your electricity, your electric grid is very vulnerable. Um, uh, I always believe in this situation that you need to identify who your, who your peers and friends are. And when it comes to uh, countries of sizes like South Africa, I would talk to the Brazilians is what I would do, uh, because the Brazilians have an, a more advanced overall cyber capacity than South Africa does. But Brazil is dealing with a lot of cyber security issues. They have real vulnerabilities there as well. And they are beginning to put a lot of money into it. So I would use those, net, those secondary uh, uh, networks that you've developed through economic relations with countries like Brazil to move it over to the, uh, to the cyber area. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. One of the things that I'm working on as a consequence of, of this. I'm on the advisory board of uh, one or two uh, NGOs. And NGOs that work uh, with uh, sensitive political issues in particular are very vulnerable to a hacks. This is a big problem in the NGO world because of course they don't have money for the high-end technical solutions which corporations and some governments can afford. And so uh, what, I'm, what I'm doing is, is I'm trying to bring together some of the NGOs I work with and pooling their defenses so that uh, they are able to integrate their systems in terms of security. Uh, and one of the other things I'm doing is, is trying to, within that context, is to get hackers who are coming out of prison and who want to work but can't get work um, uh, offering them the opportunity to work with NGOs um, and to develop security systems 
uh, for them. So that's what you have to remember because the cost of cyber security at the high end now is absolutely phenomenal. You, one might argue that you're seeing the emergence of a new military industrial complex when it comes to the products offered by Lockheed and, and Northrop Grumman and, and uh, Dedica BAE Systems and so on. You know, governments and corporations can afford these, but those of us lower down the scale simply can't manage it and we're more vulnerable as a consequence. Uh, please, here, we'll, uh, we'll take both questions back to back. Thank you. My question relates to organized crime. They haven't really talked much about the connection between organized crime and cyber attacks, whether you see that there is an increasing connection, um, whether you see any regions especially affected, and whether you actually have heard about um, illegal um, or illicit money being made even through piracy um, flowing into things like um, organized crime and cyber attacks. And just hand the Thank you, Roman Schpak with the UN. I, I have, a, I guess, a two-part question. Where does WikiLeaks fit into this? And also, can you talk a little bit about sort of language being used by uh, many states that describe as threats sort of political activism, especially in the context of Arab Spring and recent efforts to try to restrict and sort of pull resources of some states to restrict uh, activities on the internet? All very good, uh, very good, good questions. questions indeed. Um, uh, as regard to organized crime, there's a key date, which is 2008, which is interesting. It coincides almost to the day when Dark Market was taken down by an undercover, or undercover officer of the FBI, and that is the collapse of Lehman Brothers. Uh, when you have a uh, global recession, uh, particularly recessions that impact on the main consumer areas, uh, of uh, organized crime, the people who like to uh, take advantage of the goods and services offered by organized crime, um, it always results in a rethink of strategy on the part of uh, criminal syndicates. So 2008 happens, people don't have as much money anymore to uh, spend on drugs or to use for sleeping with uh, prostitutes and so on and so forth. And so organized crime has to start rethinking. And the first thing it always goes into in a recession is uh, fraud, uh, financial, uh, financial fraud, fraud and so-called boiler room fraud, trying to um, uh, target uh, individuals. And all across the, the Europe and the United States, there was a spike in fraudulent activity after the collapse of Lehman Brothers. And what happened is, is that traditional organized crime went, moves over to the, to, the, to the fraud areas because it's not selling, it's not selling as much of its uh, traditional com commodities and, and services. And it discovers in 2008 that the world of fraud has completely changed because of the internet because you can do things on a much bigger scale than you ever imagined before. And also the people who are running these frauds tend to be sort of, you know, rather nerdy, inexperienced guys who are also eager to please. And one of the things that I identified in, when uh, Warren was talking about the Swedes who went down to um, Monaco, and uh, I interviewed this guy who uh, was one of these, he's sort of the ringleader of it, he was what I call, I like to put cyber criminals in uh, three circles. And the, the first circle are the nerdy guys who are on the cold face, organizing the websites and using their skills, and who are also quite vulnerable to law enforcement because they're so vi visible. The second circle are people like this guy from uh, Sweden, who uh, is from a traditional organized crime background, but he's 30 years old, he's, you know, grown up with the internet. He's tech savvy as much as any 30 year old is. And uh, he was the one who discovered for his traditional organized crime group, the value of credit card crime and what was going on on the internet. So he acts as an intermediary between the sort of hardcore cyber criminal hackers and organized crime groups. Since 2008, law enforcement agencies across uh, the world have uh, spotted an increase in much more traditional strategies for fraud over the internet in, associated with, uh, with uh, criminal 
with uh, criminal syndicates. And that has been the general trend uh, since then, and it's a trend that is likely to increase because they are all discovering that internet fraud is um, low risk and high returns. Let me give you one example that happened in 2010 very briefly. In the first six months of 2010 in the United States, $17.5 million was stolen in traditional armed robberies against banks in the US. And of course, when you have an armed robbery in the US, uh, and people go in with you know, pump action shotguns and say, hand over the money or whatever, it's only minutes after they leave the bank that not only are the police chasing them, but CNN have got their helicopters out and they're following everything that's going on. And there's huge publicity about this. Now, during that same period, of six months, there was a fraud perpetrated by a Ukrainian group from Kiev uh, known as a payroll scam who infiltrated the uh, payroll systems, the servers of two major corporations uh, on the west coast. And what they did is they broke into the servers and they created dozens of phantom employees in these large corporations. And these phantom employees, um, you know, newly minted, um, were, of course, awarded, um, uh, you know, got an, a, a monthly salary. And that salary was sent out to so-called money mules in the United States. When you go on the internet and it says, earn money by doing nothing but sitting at your computer, the chances are that is going to be a, uh, a group from somewhere like Ukraine saying, can you please put your bank account at our disposal? Every month, you'll get $10,000 put in. Send $9,000 to a bank in Latvia, which is what happened in this case, and the money then went from Latvia to Ukraine. And uh, you can keep $1,000. Sounds like a good deal, $1,000 for doing nothing every month. So those are the money mules. And uh, within that six-month period, of the first six months of 2010, that one Ukrainian group stole $40 million, which is over twice all the money stolen uh, by conventional armed robberies in the United States in the same period. But of course, there's no publicity because you can't send out the helicopters and watch the gangsters and coppers shoot it out. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's what they mean by low risk and high returns in the cyber world. So uh, organized crime is becoming an ever greater presence on the uh, internet. And of course, there's also cyber facilitated crime, which is a, a, a different section of cyber crime, which is basically making the work that you do in traditional crimes easier because of your use of uh, computers. Now, in terms of WikiLeaks and uh, the Arab Spring and so on, this is really important. That, and it's why I mentioned earlier on about the fact that in the United States, there's no differentiation between people who are criminal hackers, between people who are ideologically motivated uh, or who are spies or whatever. The key phrase is the exceeding your authorized access. And if you do that, you're treated in the same way. But Anonymous, who uh, you know, have uh, mobilized in defense of uh, Assange and, and WikiLeaks, um, uh, argue, I think, quite convincingly, that they do this for idealist and ideological reasons. And they see themselves as a political, uh, a political group. And I think that on some level, uh, it's very important to uh, recognize that. WikiLeaks, uh, uh, OK, in, in crude practical terms, what is the impact of, of WikiLeaks? First of all, it's a consequence, of course, of the 9-11, post-9-11, touchy-feely, let's share all information in the USG, um, you know, which is absolutely great. The people who tore their hair out when this was, uh, when this was decided were people who work in intelligence. You know, they spend all this effort and time and sweat and blood getting this info, and now they have to hand it to those useless people at State Department who hand the stuff out like candy. And, uh, you know, so that's bad. But the good thing is, is, is the US government can be proud of its, um, of its employees in the State Department, because I think a lot of those cables were really well written and very interesting and illuminating. I don't think they gave much away. 
but they've certainly helped all of us on a lot of difficult subjects. So that's quite good. But of course, since then, President Obama has learnt the lesson and the touchy-feely sharing of information no longer exists and intelligence agencies are once again, uh, uh, are once again quite, uh, quite happy about that. So actually what WikiLeaks has done has worked in favor of those who argue for a tight control um, uh, on, uh, on information. Uh, I think that Assange is a really fascinating character in political terms. He's done some really interesting stuff with the WikiLeaks, and as a journalist, I heartily uh, approve of it. But there is a problem. Uh, Assange himself has no accountability. He, in many ways, displays some of the characteristics of the third group of internet criminals who I haven't talked about, who are the ones who are both great, great, with great technical ability, but they're also social engineers. They combine these uh, extraordinary abilities uh, in a behavioral pattern which psych developmental psychologists refer to as psychopathic, which doesn't mean they want to kill people. Um, uh, but it means they exploit their ability to manipulate people and their, their advanced uh, skills. And Assange, there is no accountability to Assange, uh, Assange himself. And as for autonomous, whilst I think that autonomous are a very interesting group in terms of what they reflect about youth politics and youth idealism in the internet age, again, there is no accountability. So when autonomous attacks somebody, how do we know that it's autonomous doing it? And how, do we, how can we be satisfied that it is not someone else using the name of autonomous for even more nefarious uh, purposes? So these create you know, problematic issues which we haven't, we haven't worked out. And as regards what's happening in the, uh, in the Arab world, um, I, I strongly advise you to read uh, Yevgeny Marozov's book, The Net Delusion, uh, about how the net is not necessarily the great empowerer in terms of, uh, in terms of political organization, how the Iranians and the Belarusians worked out at a very early stage that you can manipulate social media network to your own political ends. And what happened in Tunisia and in in uh, Egypt was that, you know, these gerontocracies uh, basically hadn't worked mm. out yet how important the internet could be, and they missed the boat. But a very important issue related to this, uh, uh, two, two minor points to, well, they're important points. First of all, of course, all the Western companies which have manufactured the surveillance equipment which is used on the internet by Syria, by Egypt, and so on and so forth. There's an, there's an issue here about whether we should be exporting this material to repressive regimes or not. But the other thing is, is that when you're talking about a simple issue like cyber, cyber security when it comes to law enforcement, it has ripples and implications for all sorts of other things that are going on in the internet because of that interconnectedness that I mentioned. And the question of civil liberties, which I haven't raised specifically here, is really, really important because all governments are now developing highly sophisticated surveillance techniques which they want to deploy uh, and in some cases are deploying. And we have to watch out very carefully that we do not become too watched ourselves. Uh, there are books for sale in the back. I told you at the outset that this is a book written by a storyteller. You have now heard for yourself uh, the truth of that comment. Um, about 10 minutes ago, when you were going back to the Swedes in Monte Carlo, I saw a good friend of mine in the back from the Swedish mission return to the bar <laughs> for a second drink. And this final comment means to be a very positive comment on the excellence of your presentation. I really want to have a drink also. Thank you, Thank you very much.